Hi, welcome to the next session of an intro to data analysis. In this session, we'll be working on importing and exporting of data. In particular, we'll learn how to import and export CSVs. We'll learn also how to export graphical summaries of data. And if we recall the journey that we've come along, we've come quite a ways in this um, data analysis course. We started with um, data visual. From there, we learned a bit about data transformation. We learned how to filter, select, arrange, mutate, and summarize, as well as to use group by. We then applied these skills as we moved back into data visualization. We picked up some additional theory to help us understand how to represent data uh, via geomes and aesthetics. We also learned how to show particular relationships that we're interested in um, with various plot types or geomes. And from there, we applied these skills to exploratory data analysis. And this is a technique to really dive in and understand your data. It's an iterative three-step process that you just continue snowballing through until you really understand your data. It starts with a question. You use data transformation and or data visualization to understand that question. Along the way, you refine the question or you pick up new questions and you start the process over again. From there, we, we moved into data tidying and we learned that oftentimes data comes to us in not such friendly formats and we learned how to uh, tidy our data using the gather function. And we take data and we give every single variable its own column and every observation its own row. In the following session, we learned how to do joins and binds to combine data sets into a single data set. In this session, we'll be concentrating on importing of data and exporting of data. For the importing, we'll learn how to import CSVs, which is a very common file type, and we will learn how to export CSVs and also how to export um, data visualizations as well. We'll be primarily be using the read R package to import and export the CSVs, and we'll be using ggplot2 to export the visualizations. And if you recall, in the last session, we learned about joins, left joins and inner joins. We learned that keys need to match up between tables. And we also learned about binds, row binds, which are often pretty useful, and then column binds, which are less useful because they make quite a few assumptions about the data. In this session, we will be learning about importing and exporting graphical and tabular formats. So let's dive in. Let's learn how to read and write tabular data. Now, I've never found a file type that I could not read into R. Uh, you name it, I've been able to read it in in some way, shape, or form. The file type that we're going to concentrate, though, on in this session are CSVs. And the reason are they're a very common file format. Uh, they're exported by SQL, many SQL programs, for instance. Um, commonly, they're stored in this file type for uh, academia. Um, and Excel file.xlxx can also be converted into a CSV from within Excel. So we're going to concentrate on the .csv file format. Plus, if you learn the, how to read in a CSV, a lot of this process is generalizable to the other file formats as well. So pretty simple, so I'm just going to lay out there how you read and write all in one slide. And we'll be using the tidyverse package to do, to do this, in particular the read R package, which is part of the tidyverse. So you need to call that up with the library tidyverse. And then to read in the data, you'll use read underscore CSV. And the first argument to it that you need is the path to your CSV. And you'll usually want to assign that to a variable using the assignment operator. And depending on how big your file is, you, you probably want to just assign it to a variable and then do your transformations on that, tidy it up and such um, from there. To write out a file, it's the similar type format, write underscore CSV, but your first argument is going to be the, the object. So for instance, we were working with a serial data set. If you wanted to write that out to a CSV, you'd go ahead and put that serial object in as the first argument. The second argument is the path to where you want to write the file, including the file name and then dot CSV. Some things to consider when you're uh, reading and tidying up. And the first is missing values, and the second are the data types. So missing values can come in any shape, flavor, and format. I've seen all of these here. Um, and you can specify what your NAs are. So for instance, um, by default, read underscore CSV doesn't consider null to be an NA argument or a missing value. Uh, and this is how SQL, for instance, will store its missing values. So to say, hey, these are the values I want you to consider missing, you just give it the argument NA equals, and then you give it a vector of all the arguments or the, all the string types that you want to be considered as missing values. Another consideration are the data types. Now, when you use read underscore CSV, it tries to guess what the file types are from the first hundred or so rows, and it's usually very good. These are the types of uh, variables that we'll try to guess. But sometimes it will do not such a good job. Um, sometimes you'll have a GUID, for instance, uh, an identification number, and the program will consider it to be a number. And in reality, this should probably be character. If that's the case, then you can explicitly set the column types with call underscore types argument inside of read underscore CSV. Now, how do we save visualizations? 
Well, GG Save does it. It's pretty awesome. So you, you make your plot. Let's say we made this uh, box plot, right? We plotted it to our, our window, to our graphics window. All you need to do is say GG Save and in the path to whatever you want to save it as. And it, you can save it as any of these file extensions. So for instance, if you want to save it as a PNG, all you do is you say the file name dot PNG. If you want to do PDF, you put the PDF on the end. Okay. So let's do some coding now. Okay, let's get started with coding up, reading and writing graphical and tabular data. Let's start by loading our dependencies here. And now let's learn about writing a CSV. So it asks us to use the BP underscore cylinder six data set. Looks like this. That's a subset of the MT cars data set. It's found in example data. If you want to learn more about it, question mark that data set. Okay. And it at first has us do a task before we're going to do any writing or of this information. So it says, take that data set and we'll pipe it forward. And it says, change the cells in horsepower column to 999 if the VS column is zero. So we haven't really done this, but you can take one column and use information in another column to adjust values. And if we're changing or overwriting a column, the function that should come to your mind is mutate. So if you're making a new column or overwriting a new or an old one, you should think mutate. And we want to take the horsepower variable and we want to change some values. So if we're recoding, the function that should come to your name by now is case when. And let's go ahead and just put that on so we'll give a little bit of space on each line. And the, the condition we need to look at first is if VS is zero, then make it 999. So we can do that. And we say VS equals zero and And we can say, then make it 999. I guess we can do an actual number 999. Now, if we're concerned that this is a float, you could also say near. If VS is near zero, then make it 999. And we still have to worry about the other values. What we want to do is everything else in horsepower, just make it itself. So if it's true, everything else is what that means, make it what it already is. And we can see, oh, okay, those values were overwritten, that where VS was zero, we can see that it was overwritten with a 999 in horsepower, right? And we're doing this 999. This is a common missing value format in academia, particularly like SPSS. It's considered a value that's highly unlikely to happen. Not my preference, but sometimes you get data where 999 is a missing value. Next, it says change cells in car column to null if car is equal to 4. Go ahead and pause the video and do that on your own. This is just almost identical to the previous uh, instance where we changed horsepower to 999. Okay, and you can see what I've done here. I used a case win just like before, where carb equals four, make it null, and I did indeed use a character null, which is not a true null, it's just a character. Um, and then I said everything else, just go ahead and make a car. So let's see what that looks like. And we see indeed that where um, carb was four, we now have a null. Now, the last thing we're supposed to do is to assign this output to miss six. Go ahead and do that on your own now, pause the video. And here we use the assignment operator with miss six. Make sure you run that. And then you can type miss six into the console. It's in our memory. And we can see it returns that value. Now it wants us to write miss six to an external CSV file called six data with missing values CSV. That is a mouthful. So to do that, write underscore CSV. You type in the data set, which is, or the object, data object, which is miss six. You type in the file path. And this will just go into our working directory. Remember, get wd tells you your working directory. It will go into that directory for me. And I go ahead and write that out. And it says open that up and look at your freshly minted csv file. Go ahead and do that now. Here I've opened it up in Excel, and you can see that the file printed out or saved out uh, like it was in our console with the nulls, and you can see 999 for uh, horsepower. Let's go back in and start on the next step. Now it wants us to read the contents of that same file back into R. So I often, if I have just written something out and I want to read it back in, I can grab the same exact code and I do this little shortcut. I cut and paste it, grab the first object name, delete it out, put it in front, and write the assignment operator. And you read it right back in. And it gives you an error message because you also need to change write CSV to read CSV. And you read it right back in. We could have called it whatever we wanted to. We could have called it miss six two, you know. Now, there's kind of a problem though. 
And the problem is that those null values, often you will get data, particularly if it comes from SQL, SQL where you have null and that's actually a missing value. And right now it's not being recognized as a missing value. Same with horsepower with 999. I doubt there's any cars with the 999 horsepower. Well, maybe there are, but they're probably outside of my price range. So what we need to do is to convert this to proper missing values when it's being read in. Go ahead and pause the video and try to do that on your own now. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut and paste from the uh, code we just read, wrote up above down below and remember the second art or another argument not the second argument to read csv is na and it specifies the na values we want to use right and we know that quote quote or blank cells we know that na we know that null cells could be and we know that 999 could be so let's go ahead and reread that data in And now we see that those missing values are indeed missing values as we would expect. Now I'm going to have you create a, an external data set, a CSV. And just, by, just to do that, go ahead and run this code here. I'm not going to really explain to you what that code's doing so much. It's just emptying, dumping out a CSV file into your working directory. The CSV file will be called skipped.csv, right? I want you to go navigate to that file and find it and open it up in Excel or whatever your program is for looking at CSVs. And you'll see that, hey, we have some tabular data here, right? But we also have some metadata up here that is not gonna play so pretty with read underscore CSV. So we're gonna read that file right back in and I wanna, want you to see what happens. Well, it tries to read in the metadata and property of awesome sauce is a column header. This really isn't what we want. So these are pieces of metadata that we don't wanna read in as a table. So we need to skip those. So we can skip them with, believe it or not, a skip argument. Skip equals, and we tell it the number of lines to skip. And here we can see it's one, two, three, four. After that, the data set starts. So skip four lines, and then we just read it in. And now it reads in as we would expect. Let's compare it. Okay. Now let's move into saving images. And we're gonna go ahead and run this code here. It's gonna create a subset of the New York dogs. And we'll talk about that data set a little bit. Okay, and we can see it has just dachshunds in it. And I picked that because I have two dachshunds. And I guess if you're making your own videos, you can make things that are fun for you. So from the major New York dogs, I picked out dachshunds. And here's how I did it. There's lots of different types of dachshunds. So first I started by counting up the breeds, right? And you can see it formed two columns that just count how many of each breed there were. Went ahead and made a proportion by taking N divided by all the dogs, right? And we can figure out how many are proportion of each breed. Then I went ahead and said, you know what? I want anywhere where there's a type of dachshund. And there's multiple types of dachshunds. So I use the grep L function. And this is, works on strings. I'm explaining, this is not really part of the course, but it's interesting stuff that you may run into. And so you can find um, strings using a quasi fuzzy type matching by saying, you know what? Any string that starts, and that's what this character means. It's uh, a regular expression. Any uh, string that starts with this, go ahead and return that to me or filter out those rows. And then I arranged descending on N and it pulls out the, the dachshunds and their counts and their proportions of the total number of dogs, right? So pretty cool. Now it's asking us to make a bar plot, a horizontal bar plot showing the proportion of dachshund types relative to the rest of the New York dogs. So, dogs. so that's what this proportion is. It's relative to the rest of the dogs. There's not many dachshunds actually. We see that less than 1%, maybe close to 1% of, dogs, or of dogs in New York, this New York City district uh, are smooth coats which I have a wire-haired miniature and I have a smooth um, red, not a mini. So I have one of the ones I've highlighted and I have this one here. So let's go ahead and take that and plot it. So New York Dogs, we're gonna pipe it forward. Actually, why don't you pause the video and try it on your own. All right, let's continue on. So the boilerplate will need ggplot2, or ggplot I should say. The package is ggplot2, and we know it's the aesthetics, we're going to want the x variable will be breed, and we're going to want the y variable to be um, prop, right? And then we're going to go ahead and say, pipe it to the next line. Remember, we need ggplot2 pipe, and we're going to say geom bar. And we know that this is not going to be counting up the number of breeds. We've already done that with a summary up here. We're going to say the stat for this is not count. Stat is identity. And we could go ahead and plot that. Um, 
you see a bit of a problem though. And the problem is it is not ordered, right? So we have something here. Actually, let's we've got a number of problems. So the first is we, this needs to be horizontal. So let's go ahead and make it horizontal so we can read things and then we'll talk about other problems. Okay, now it's horizontal and you can see this dachshund long haired miniature. This is not ordered. It looks close to order, but it's not ordered. So if it's ordered, what are we gonna have to do? Um, we're gonna have to make a factor. So that means we're gonna have to change the breed to be ordered an ordered factor. So we're gonna overwrite that column. So we're gonna use mutate to do that. And we know that it's gonna be breed that we're operating on equals, and we'll say factor breed, right? We're gonna say levels equals breed. We know they're unique already. We go ahead and plot that now. Now it's ordered. But let's say we wanted uh, the order to go the other way. I think what we'd wanna do then is take the levels for breed and there's a couple things we could do. We could instead go reverse around breed which is a new function for us, and that works. Or we could say, you know what, before we arranged it descending, let's arrange it ascending, and we'll get the same effect, All right? So now we're doing, I think everything it's asked. We've made an ordered bar plot showing a portion of dachshund types relative to the New York City Dogs data set. All right, we've done that. And then it says, what story can you tell with a graph? Well, something that's interesting, if I'm comparing right off the bat, we can see that the smooth red coat makes up, it looks like to me, more than all the rest of the dachshunds put together. So we could actually test that. You know, we have a new question. Are smooth red coats, do they outnumber all the rest of the dachshunds put together? Eyeballing, I say that's true, but is it? And we have the skills to do this. We could make a plot, but it's easy enough. This is easy enough to cognitively deal with. It seems like a binary variable we want to make, right? So we could basically take the counts here for the smooth coats and count it against everyone else. So how would we do that? Well, in a sense, we need a new variable. We need to say these guys versus everyone else. So that tells me we need a new variable. Mutate right away springs it in my mind. And we're doing a re regrouping, essentially. And so we're going to take breed. We'll call it breed2 equals, and we know it's regrouping, so case win. And we'll say case win. And there's a number of ways we could do this, but case win... Um, breed equals this. Actually, we can do it kind of even easier by saying case when breed not equal this, call it other, and we'll say dachshunds. And then we can say everything else. Everything else, go ahead and make it breed, which will be the smooth red coats, right? And I know I made a mistake here, actually up here as well, with my quotes. There we go. And we see the, the code syntax highlighting then came to life when I fixed that. Let's go ahead and run that. And now we have a new variable. I'm going to do a little more real estate here so we can see that. We have a new variable here where we have the smooth coats versus everyone else. And now we can actually do a summarization. And we can say, um, basically we want to add up the ends and the props. Um, we need to group by, of course, by breed two. Let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to say for n equals sum of n. And the same thing with prop. Prop will equal the sum of prop. Let's go ahead and check that out. And we can see that indeed that our hunch that the dachshunds that were smooth coats outnumbered all the other dachshunds put together was indeed true. And together, that they make up maybe one and a half, a little under one and a half percent of all the dogs in New York City. So, a small number of New York City dogs are dachshunds. Now, let's save that plot we just made, right? So, we made the plot here, and to save that, just GG save, and we can say where we want to save it to. So, we let, we can call it anything we want. We can say my plot dot. It asks us to make it as a PNG and a PDF, so we can actually just copy the same code twice. And call this PDF, right? We can go ahead and save those. And we can see in files my plot. And we can see the, the plot. Oops, that is not my plot. That's because I have my ploy instead of my plot. Let's go ahead and fix those right now. Saved it. And now you can see produce those. Actually, we have a PDF and a PNG. So let's open them both up. There's the PNG. Uh, quality typically is not as good on a PNG. Quality is typically better in the vectorized PDF. You can scale it infinitely. 
well, not infinitely, I guess, but pretty high resolution, even at 64,000%. Now you can also specify to ggsave the dimensions you want. So we could save it as a 20 inch by 20 inch using the height and width arguments. Height equals 20 and it's in inches, width equals 20. And we'll call it my plot big. And there it is. Let's open it up. And you can see it starts out huge. At 100%, it's huge. So we can scale back and we see how little the font became, but the bar still remained large. So that's how we can adjust the resolution on plots. Now there's a bit of work here to do independently, just for practice, uh, how to write out different CSVs, read them in, and then also do some plotting externally.